We are here now with Rom at his farm at Palm Bukudivana. Is that right? That's right. <laughs> Which translated means the forest where snakes live. They're here. People come to the gate and say, Sir, show me snakes. I say, yes, please, go and look. Be go my and look. guest. <laughs> this was apparently 12 acres of uh, rice fields before you bought it. This was all rice field. Every single tree you see here now, including the bamboo, everything we planted. And how did you think about buying this place, moving here? How did all of that really happen? It really happened because working and living at the same place, which was the crock bank for 20 years, became kind of impossible. People would call me at midnight, uh, sir, there's a crocodile with a tear in his eye, or you know, some ridiculous story. Wake me up and stuff. So I wanted to live away from the, my place of work. <laughs> so it's been 20 years since you moved here? 27 years this year, yeah. And I mean, uh, I've read that you've, you, you have leopards here, you have a lot of wildlife here, you mm. have uh, civets, you have uh, jungle lots, cats. Lots. Well, I, you know, what we started doing is we started setting camera traps up mm -hmm. here, and I can show you some of the pictures we got. And uh, it was quite amazing because every single night we got some animal or the other. Leopards we didn't know about until Janaki lost her dog. Okay. And then we actually thought the dog was stolen. But uh, when I called one of my Irla friends, we started tracking where the dog might have been disappeared over the fence or whatever and came to a place at the base of this hill right here where we found the dog's carcass. It was completely eaten. Still had the collar on, so it was obviously the same dog, but a leopard had gotten it. Then we started setting up camera traps religiously, and we got some fantastic pictures of this leopard and looking straight at the camera, and yeah. Janaki was really angry. All of, well, both of us were really angry. We said, let's get the forest department to take this damn thing away. And then we kind of thought a little while and we talked to people like Vidya Treya and we, we agreed, look, we've moved into its habitat. It didn't come here. It was here already. So let's take care of our dogs a little bit better. You know? That's the lesson. So how are you safeguarding your dogs right now? You they still sleep, have in, to... sleep in the house at night. <laughs> <laughs> and when early in the morning when they want to go out and take a leak, you take your torch and you shine, I shine first. Make sure there are no bright eyes shining at you from the bushes because that means the leopard's waiting. In fact, it happened that way. Mm -hmm. So we started keeping them in the house at night and out, uh, take them out in the morning. You know, thinking well, leopards are nocturnal, right? So one morning, uh, about 6 or 6.30, it was after sunrise, I took the dogs out and they went out to take a leak and I sort of turned around sleepy, uh, still in my lungi, sleepy, going back to the house and I suddenly heard like that. And I turned around and there was the leopard on top of another dog of ours, oh, wow. Coco, another German shepherd. And I, con I swore <laughs> and uh, I called, Janaki, it's a bloody leopard. And I turned back around again and the leopard had disappeared and the dog jumped up. So it wasn't killed, it was just injured. And um, probably because there were, uh, w there were two other dogs with it, you know, and it's probably they got, the, the leopard probably got very... You know, unnerved. Uh, yeah, unnerved and just let the uh, dog alone. Films have also been a very integral part of your life from the early years. Mm. Uh, you know, starting with the fact that your stepfather came to Bombay to make films and he worked with a whole lot of stars from that time. Well, he actually was in the film processing yeah. side of things. Yeah. He set up India's first color processing yeah. laboratory called Ramnord in Worli in Bombay. And, uh, you know, that was kind of the beginning of Bollywood because it was the early 50s. I mean, Indian, India had already made plenty of films, but it was the real boom time for Bollywood to start happening. So he was there at the right time. But the thing is, we got to hobnob with people like Vijayanti Mala and Dev Anand and Nimi. And I, I just remember lots and lots of movie stars. To me, they didn't really mean much on this. I never got an autograph or anything. So you like had that. no idea that you were hobnobbing with all these well, uh, I knew about fancy it, people. but it didn't mean anything to me. I was a snake guy from the beginning. So. <laughs> you also went on to make a lot of wildlife films yourself. Uh, uh, you know, you, you were a TV presenter, I mean, more than a TV presenter, wildlife series presenter for a very long time, and you really popularized this whole idea of wildlife filmmaking. How did that happen? How did you you know, get into the whole film side of things and... I'll tell you the beginning of it was actually a friend of ours, a, a, a couple, uh, John and Louise Reber, they were in Cody Canal School uh, with me, they were younger than me, but they had already started making films. 
And we came up with this idea. We wanted to make a film about snake bite and how it can be prevented and how it can be avoided and what to do. So we did. We made a film, a film called Snake Bite. And I won't go through all the mechanics of how we managed to do it, but we used all wind-up Bullex cameras, you know, and old sound equipment. I mean, really ancient stuff. But the film won an award, a gold medal from the Medical Association in England, and a first prize at, uh, at the film festival up in Montana. And we said, wow, we, we got prizes out of this little film? So we actually started getting a bit more serious. But I wanted to do National Geographic. I mean, come on, every filmmaker yeah. wants to. Yeah. So the breakthrough there had to be, I was told it's a real old boys network and unless you've got an in, you're not gonna get in. So I said, well, how am I gonna do this? So I said, well, this is actually how I met Janaki too, because I needed a show reel. So I'd done quite a few little films, none of it spectacular, but you can make it spectacular by using the, the, your best bits into one show reel, which she put together for me. I took it to National Geographic they looked at it, they were interested, but I, I could tell by their expressions, and I had already heard it's an old boys network, I've got to find some other in for this. In the hallway of National Geographic in Washington, D.C., I met this lady called Carol Fornetti Foster, and she said, you're Ron Whitaker. Hey, I just saw a, 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 a film um, a, a pitch that, that you did to a, a film company in England. But a girl brought it over from that film company and she's trying to pitch it as their film. But isn't it yours? I said, what is it called? She said, it's called Rat Wars. I said, yeah, that's my film. I mean, hopefully. She said, why don't we make it together? I've already made a several films for National Geographic. That was the opening, basically. Carol mm -hmm. got us into it. And her husband is a was a fantastic uh, cinematographer. And uh, I don't know, we just got together and made this film called Rat Wars. And, once you're in, you're in. Okay. After that, <laughs> we started pitching and getting more films. <laughs> so yeah. how did the whole uh, the the Dragon series happen? Yeah, that was kind what of. What was it called? Dragon. Yeah, uh, Dragon Chronicles. Dragon Chronicles. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that. To be honest with you, that's the corniest one of all because it, it had <laughs> no real purpose. <laughs> yeah. It just it was for fun. The next film after the Rat Wars we made what we proposed was called King Cobra. Mm. And no one had ever made a full-length documentary, a one-hour documentary on one species of snake. It had never been done. And everyone looked at us as though we were crackers. The snakes, when they're happy, they look like this. When they're sad, they look like this. When they're angry, they look like this. They have no expressions. You know, what are you gonna, what's the personality of a snake? How are you gonna... But I, I kind of knew this is the snake of snakes. I mean, you know, it's the biggest venomous snake in the world. We knew we could do something with it. 12 feet of venomous snake. You know, this is the super snake. In comparison, an anaconda is like a big earthworm. This is the story of one man's quest to save the king. Well, it took us three years to finish the film, well, another two years, so a total of three years. It won an Emmy, which was a strange thing for us because we didn't know even what an Emmy was. And someone said, you gotta come to New York and you gotta wear a tuxedo. And I said, no way, Jose, I'm not gonna go. Did you own a tuxedo? No, I didn't own one, nor was I gonna go to New York just to go to some ceremony. So they sent it to us by post. It's there in the office if you wanna yeah. see it. <laughs> there are lots of series on wildlife that right now what do you think of them from the perspective of what you've done so far? I don't watch TV. Okay. So I, I, I know roughly what's going on now okay. and I know I don't like it. Because okay. it's all super special, super mm. spectacular and you gotta almost die to get the right shot and all this mm. kind of stuff. Mm. Uh, I, that's basically why my films and our, ki our kind of films are not really popular anymore. 
and why I'm not get, being asked to do anything. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, I don't want to almost kill myself every time or, or do something insane. Things have gone a little bit crazy now and people want much more drama and much more excitement than we could ever produce in those earlier films of ours. So what do you think wildlife films really should be like? Wildlife literature, wildlife films, you know, what is your opinion on what? Well, I'll tell you, I, I shouldn't criticize these wild films too badly because if they're waking people up and getting people excited about wildlife, well, I have more power to them. It's just that I wouldn't want to be involved in doing them. But uh, I, I think that, yeah, they've got to be dramatic footage. They've got to be stuff that's right in your face so that it attracts and keeps the attention so they don't keep flipping the bloody channels. But at the same time, they've got to have a good message, you know, a really good message. For example, I, instead of, well, maybe along with showing how dangerous an animal can be, protest that it's an innocent danger. It, it's, it, it, the animal is totally innocent. If, if it, it kills and eats a human being, it's, well, it's horrible for the human being, it hurts, and for their family and everything else, but it's what the animal does. And, and the person has put himself in that position to get eaten and killed and eaten. I mean, I, I, I don't want to defend man-eating tigers or whatever it is, but the fact is that uh, people put themselves into the wrong position by circumstances, by fate. So it is a, a, a big problem, but make it a little more balanced, you know, look at it from the animal's perspective. Maybe that's the best way of coming out with a really acceptable wildlife film these days. Mm. Yeah. What, what are your views on conservation today? What do you think is being done well? What do you think is not being done well? What do you think needs more attention? Uh, are we speaking in the Indian context? In the Indian context, yes. Then I better keep my mouth shut. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of politics for one thing, but uh, yeah, I mean, things are going in the right direction in many ways, but f for example, as soon as they want to build a highway through a sanctuary or something like that, that is, that's, that's dangerous. That's really absolutely a no. And I, I know that they are making some efforts to make underpasses, and I've seen some brilliant footage of photography of, of animals like tigers and even elephants going through underpasses. They try to make bridges over highways. Elephants don't like bridges. They'll go under, but very unlikely to go on top. So whatever's going to, development has to happen. I mean, it's not as though we're going to stop development and the world is going to be 50% wild and 50% human. No, it's not. It's going to be 80% humans and 20% wild, max. So let's do it right. I mean, a big mining company is going to keep mining. And if we say no mines, all right, then don't bloody drive your car. Don't bloody no petrol. Yeah, OK, then don't drive. Buy an electric car, pay, you know, $50,000 or whatever. Put your money where your mouth is. So, you know, all this criticism of industry and stuff like that has to stop at a certain point or at a certain point, industry's got to also realize, well, we can do different things differently. And there are genuine uh, people and organizations working with genuine, honest, interested industry to make things good, make things better. And you, you can't wipe out the past, but you can certainly do things better for the future. You know, in this place that you live in right now, yeah. uh, in a sense, you're back to where it began. I mean that in the metaphoric sense, that you're, you know, you're surrounded by, um, by animals, you're surrounded by snakes, you're surrounded by uh, trees. What is your typical day like here? <laughs> well, that's a good question. I, I spend a lot of time wandering around, actually. I can but, imagine. Yeah. Well, the hill which is behind us here, which you can't see because there's too many trees. In fact, Janaki keeps saying, can't we trim some of the trees so we can see the hill at least? No, no. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, my day consists of doing... I'm, I'm quite a bit into writing and doing other stuff. and. This whole snake bite thing means I have to get drawn off to Delhi and other places to meet with the ICMR or doctors and, and, and do stuff like that. So it's, it's a very mixed day I have. And occasionally going over to the crock bank to make sure things are going okay, or if they have a question. Uh, yeah, it's a very varying, every day is different. So I have three questions for you, mm -hmm. sent by three different Herpetologists or wildlife biologists who worked with you. Okay? Hmm. Interesting questions. Nirmal Kulkarni yes. asks, what is your favorite snake in terms of color? Oh. 
I think it was a trick question there. I think he wants you to say something. That... Yeah, I kind of know what he wants to say. To be honest with you, when someone says, what's your favorite snake, I find it very, very difficult to yeah. give an answer because I got lots of favorites. Yeah. You're looking at snakes color. Yeah. One of the most startling snakes, certainly in India, is the flying snake. Okay. okay? And that's in the Western Ghats and Nirmal. Nirmal knows that one yeah. very well. But uh, there are also snakes like the banded crate, which is black, yellow, black, yellow. It's a very standard color, but uh, some interesting guys up in Calcutta call it taxi snake, because this is the black and yellow, you know? So I thought that was pretty funny. But um, I think I would stick with the flying snake for different beautiful colors, yeah, for India. Yeah. Jerry Martin asks, what would be the best attire for a young and aspiring snake enthusiast to go looking for snakes in a rainforest? Would a hornbill feather have anything to do with it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, he's seen the picture. Uh, it's an X-rated picture of me with a loincloth on walking through the rainforest with the hornbill feathers stuck in my hair. I'm not going to show you that picture because I'm slightly embarrassed by it. <laughs> but it was my real hippie days when loincloth it, it, I'll tell you why I did that. I really had this feeling that if I had any metal objects or any stinky human objects on me, I wasn't going to find a king cobra. That was really what I thought. So no ring. I said, oh God, I've got metal fillings in my teeth. I didn't rip all my teeth out, luckily. I didn't go that far. But I didn't have any metal objects. I didn't have a metal snake hook. I had a bamboo snake stick. And I found a king cobra. <laughs> So it worked. It worked. The loincloth and the, <laughs> it worked. And the hornbill feather. That's all I got to say. What's with the hornbill feather? Though? But I don't recommend that to a young person. <laughs> no. Especially because leeches, ticks, uh, stinging nettle. Uh, you know, there are lots of things in the forest where you should have some reasonable protection. You know, ordinary pants, shirt, and <laughs> at least tennis shoes. Okay. I don't wear boots, but tennis shoes, yeah. Okay, and the last one. Karthik Shankar oh. asks, have you ever been bitten on the nose by a vine snake? What a freak. <laughs> the guy knows that I got bitten on the nose by... Okay, he wants the story. He obviously wants the story. Okay. <laughs> on record. <laughs> okay, I used to be a Jawa motorcycle rider when I was living in Gaimuk Bandar outside of Bombay. And every day I would stop at... There's a little petrol station at the bottom of Pedro Road. And uh, everyone who knows Bombay will know where Pedro Road is. And there was a little gas station there. And I always stopped there. And they say, ah, Sampala, kya kya Sampai. They say, what snakes do you have? You know, and I said, huh, I'll show you one. So I took up my knapsack. They were filling petrol. Meanwhile, looking, looking. They, you know, they were having fun. I was having fun. I took out this vine snake. And I said, deko, ye harasamp. If this green snake, everyone says that has a pointy nose, because it wants to strike you in the eye and put out your eye. I said, what nonsense. I'm not sure what the equivalent of bullshit was in Hindi, but I said, this is really bullshit. Watch, I'm holding it next to my face. Is it striking my eye? <laughs> it grabs me by the nose. Not only grabbed me by the nose, it gave me a good hard bite and hung on there. So I sort of put my thumb or my finger into its mouth and it clamped on my finger. And then, but meanwhile, my nose was absolutely bleeding. And if you know, when you get your nose hurt, you, you start tearing. So it really looked like I was crying and I was in bad shape because all the blood was dripping down and the guys were just horrified, you know. They said, Abhi mar jayega. They, this guy is going to die for sure, you know. And I could hear them say that. I said, Ay, it's nothing, it's not a venomous thing. Yeah, you say it's not venomous. Look at the blood and, you know, all this. Uh, this went on for a little while and I took my handkerchief and wiped my nose off and put the snake back and got on my motorbike and said bye. And I could see them watching me down there, waiting for me to <laughs> crash over. But I rode off into the sunrise or the sunset or whatever it was, I was okay. <laughs> good yeah. story. It was a good one. Yeah, that really worked. I mean, it didn't work. It didn't work. Yeah. I mean, it was a good lesson for me. <laughs> <laughs>